Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the service that I'm working in right now at the IWK. It's called the Pediatric Health Psychology Service and in that service uh, we work with children and youth with both acute and chronic illnesses. Uh, referrals come to us typically from physicians within the hospital and common um, questions are about coping with procedures, painful procedures, difficult procedures, coping with hospitalization, managing symptoms, nausea, pain, that kind of thing, um, adherence to treatment, particularly as kids grow up and become teenagers and need to take more responsibility on their, on their own, um, general issues relating to coping with illness, so being different from their friends, um, not being able to participate in all the activities they want to, and the topic of today, um, parenting issues related specifically to chronic illness. I want to give a little bit of information about other services that are available at the IWK that might be available for some of you um, in the audience. There's a, a psychologist with the Rehabilitation Psychology Service, so that's uh, kids with neuromuscular disorders, um, spina bifida, cerebral palsy. There's a psychology with, uh, psychologist with hematology, oncology, nephrology. There's one with the complex pain clinic and one with the feeding and nutrition clinic. And the pediatric health psychology service that I work in is basically everything that doesn't fit into those categories. Other areas, um, so any of you that are at the off-site clinics, a lot of the times the services aren't going to be provided by a specialty health psychology clinic, um, but the same kinds of services would be accessible through mental health clinics. And we're also available um, in our service to provide consultation to those people, share resources, um, some of the strategies that we use, that kind of thing. Whereas here in Halifax, the mental health clinics is, are specific to people that have uh, mental health disorders such as anxiety, depression, um, and that kind of thing. So if, at the end, we'll have some time for questions, and if you have questions about um, how to access services in your area, we can talk about that. So for today's agenda, um, I was hoping to speak about uh, common parenting challenges and specifically ones that arise um, in parenting youth with chronic illness. Um, some specific issues about helping your child or your teenager to achieve increased independence over time. And then some special topics, specific topics like school attendance, uh, siblings, peers, depression, and parental stress. And then like I said, we'll have some time at the end um, for both questions discussion and if people want to have an opportunity to share information with each other. Um, just a little bit of a caveat. Uh, when I'm talking about youth with chronic illness, but we're, this really, although it's a, a narrow area in terms of um, you know other parents, there's actually quite a lot of variability in this population. So I've heard that some of you um, have children who have cancer or who have epilepsy, have arthritis, and the challenges that you're facing are going to differ a lot from one person to another, from one family to another. Obviously, there's going to be variability across age and development mental stage um, and across illness groups and also within illness groups. So some key things that might make your experiences different, uh, history of traumatic events, uh, the prognosis that your child is dealing with, um, and also the nature of the how the illness impacts on your daily life. So some illnesses, um, the child might be fine for a period of time, months or even longer, and then have a, a serious episode where um, they have a relapse. Others uh, might be fine a lot of the time and have random events that just seem to come out of the blue and can really um, cause crises for the family. And others have illnesses that are more of a <laughs> daily thing that every single day they have to follow a certain diet or follow a certain regimen. And so, you know, which category your child is fitting in is really going to impact um, some of the things that we're going to be talking about. So I hope that a lot of the things that I'm going to say will be able to um, relate a, a little bit to your experience, but you may need to um, take some of what I'm talking about and, and see if you can apply it to your own situation. So uh, to start talking about some of the challenges that um, parents of youth with chronic illness are facing, and again, back to the youth thing, I'm going to probably interchange a little bit children, youth, and I'm, I'm sort of meaning the whole spectrum. Some of the things we'll talk about are about younger kids and some are older, but um, we're really talking about the whole spectrum of, of young people. Um, all parents need to try to do two things. They need to try to avoid being overly permissive and not setting any limits and also being overly protective and not allowing their child any 
opportunities for growth or responsibility. And this, you'll hear me say this a lot tonight, um, can be especially hard uh, for parents of youth with a chronic illness. So to start first with uh, being overly permissive. We know that it can be more challenging to set limits on a child who has a chronic illness and, and there's a lot of reasons for this and I'm, I'm sharing with you reasons that I've read about and reasons that I've heard um, from other parents. Um, a very, very common one, they've already been through so much. How can I then um, set so many other limits on them that might be typical for other children? They've already got so many limits imposed upon them by their illness. They're not allowed to do this, that. Um, so again, I want to let them have some freedom and flexibility in other areas, eat as much candy as they want or whatever it might be. Um, and, and it's true that there's probably some room for some flexibility, but we'll talk about why you, you still want to have some, some limits in place. Also, you as parents already have to impose extra limits on them because of their illness. So you're already doing 70 things that other parents aren't having to do. So you don't have a lot of time, energy, um, at the end of that maybe to um, have them clean up their room or get to bed on time or whatever the more general limits might be. Also, most of us have a lot of empathy for what um, children with chronic illness are going through, and it's easy to understand where their negative behavior comes from, so it feels easier to excuse it. Well, you know, they've just had a major surgery. Obviously, they're going to be cranky. Um, true, but again, we need to think about where the limits are still going to be. There's also probably some unique challenges relating, uh, related to developmental differences. So if, if your child, because of the nature of their illness or because of their hospitalizations, um, they might not be developing at the same pace as other children. Um, you, you might not have as much of a ruler about, you know, a four-year-old ought to be doing this by now. Well, you know, my child isn't developing at the same age, uh, at the same pace at other four-year-olds. So it might be a little bit, um, you might not be as clear about what kind of limits are age appropriate. Um, also, there's an overwhelming need to attend to medically related issues, and so that's where your focus is, and so that's where your priorities are. So you, you're not as focused on um, other more general limits. And we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but your own feelings of guilt, worry, stress um, are obviously going to impact on your willingness to set limits and also your ability to set limits. So why is it still important um, to set limits? Basically, all children and youth feel safer with structure and limits that match their developmental level. The world is a very confusing place with no limits. And I can still remember the very first child that I worked with in the health psychology area. Um, before, before that, I had worked in a more general mental health kind of setting with lots of kids um, with all kinds of behavioral issues and anxiety and that kind of thing. And I felt pretty confident about what I should do in certain kinds of situations. And then I headed into my first experience under supervision um, in health psychology setting. And the first boy that I met was a seven-year-old boy who had had a terrible infection and was in ICU and he almost died and he was fresh out of ICU. And the referral came to my supervisor um, because he was hitting his mom. Um, if he'd get frustrated, he would just strike out at his mom. And I, I was confused at first because I thought, I know exactly what to do. If this was like your typical seven-year-old boy, I know it's time out, like it's consequences, um, this is what we need to do. But what about this situation? All he's been through, the worries he must have, um, the stress that his parents must be under. You can't give him a time out. Um, and luckily my supervisor was the one handling it and she, she walked in and she said um, to, the, to the parent, what would you have done if this had happened a month ago? And the mother said, well, it, would have, it wasn't a time out, maybe taking away his television or sending him to his room. Um, and my supervisor said, well, you know, that's exactly what we need to do then. We need to do the same thing that you would have done a month ago. Um, you can't give a child a time out when he's confined to his bed. So my supervisor said, well, if he hits you, you need to leave the room, which again, wow, after all this boy has been through, he's been so sick, he feels so crummy, and the mom's going to leave the room. Um, I talked about it a lot with my supervisor because it was a shift in the way I was thinking about children with chronic illness, and she explained that, you know, if, if now this seven-year-old boy knows that he can hit his mom and, and get away with that when he knows that's not okay, and other kids that's not okay for them, um, the world 
has really become a mixed up place. Uh, the world doesn't make sense anymore if you're allowed to do that and get away with it. And in very short order, he would hit his mom, his mom would leave the room, she would come back after a period of time. And not only did the hitting stop, but he also, his personality started coming back. It was almost like, hey, the world, you know, you might have been through this horrible thing, but the world is still the world that it used to be. And I try to keep that um, situation in mind as I'm working with kids because when, when they're going through um, difficult situations, I still have this little tendency to kind of, oh, what, what they've been through. But I really try to remember that um, kids still do need their limits. Um, also, at, at some point, your child, teen, or young adult is going to encounter limits set by other people. So even if you think you can kind of get away with no limits in your home, and some people do, um, they're still going to need to learn that other people in the world are going to expect them to behave in certain ways, whether it's their friends, their teachers, their bosses, and uh, you're the best person to teach them about those things, um, no matter what it is that they're going through. I talked about this a little bit before, but understanding why a behavior occurs is not the same as excusing a behavior. So you might, you might really be able to see, you know, my child is not feeling well, and I see more of the irritability coming out. Um, I see him arguing with his sister more, and, and, and it's true, we do, we do understand why that's happening. But if it's a house rule, that you don't name call your sister or you don't throw something at her, then, then that's still the house rule even if they're not um, feeling their best. You, so I've sort of alluded to this as well, You've, you do need to respect your child's differences but also ask yourself what would I do if this were another child? So if this, I, lots of times um, when I've worked with parents, they've said, oh if this was his brother, I, I would know exactly what to do, but I can't do the same thing with him. Um, and, and really, the behavioral principles, the parenting principles, don't change. Or what would I have done if this was before the diagnosis? Oftentimes, you know the right answer. Um, another tip is to think about strategies that you already use to set limits successfully and apply those to new areas. So most parents don't drive out of the driveway unless their child is, it has their seatbelt on, even though most kids don't want to sit in the back and don't want to wear their seatbelt. But somehow most parents figure that out. And usually it's the car's not moving until your seatbelt's on. So if you're, if you're into a struggle with setting limits, um, maybe they don't want to take their medication. Well, think about this, how to apply that same principle to that new situation. So maybe it's the TV doesn't come on until you've taken your medication. Um, and at some point they got it about the seatbelt that you, you really weren't going to move the car. So they also could understand as well that you're not going to turn the TV on until they've taken their medication. Um, the main principle for any kind of behavior change, and this is for children, teenagers, adults, even animals, is any response that's followed by a positive consequence is likely to be repeated, and any response that's followed by a negative consequence is less likely to be repeated. So this is the foundation principle of all of the parenting strategies that you might have heard about. Um, praise, reward, timeouts, removal of privileges, um, all of those things kind of come back to this main principle. So if there's, if there's anything you ever need to come back to when you're stuck with setting limits. It's this uh, main principle. And I just, I just put up on the slide here um, for those of you who are parents of younger children, a book that um, really fleshes this out nicely called The Incredible Years, A Troubleshooting Guide for Children Aged 2 to 8, if you're interested in uh, reading more about that. So now we're going to switch to the other side of the spectrum, which I think is almost even a bigger challenge for parents of children um, with chronic illnesses, and that is um, how to avoid being overly protective um, and not allowing any risk or responsibility. I think it's pretty clear why it's easier to be over, overly protective. You know more than most parents the fear of your child being sick or dying, and you will do whatever you can to protect your child. And this is a normal and natural response, but you have to be careful that your protectiveness is reasonable and still allows your child to achieve independence and responsibility. It's a simple concept, but it's very tough to do, I know. But it, it might help to kind of look at some of the benefits of allowing a child to take risks and take on responsibility. 
and another little story for you, but this is a personal one about my daughter. When um, my daughter was just starting to crawl around and things, I had been reading a magazine article or a book, I can't remember, and it started out with talking about how to bubble wrap your coffee table. And I was very excited about this because what a fantastic idea that would be because she wouldn't be able to bump her head on the sharp edges. And when I got to the end of the paragraph, I should have seen it coming, but it was actually um, a joke saying, of course, you wouldn't be bubble wrapping your coffee table because how else would your child be able to um, stay away from sharp edges? And, and I had been talking with parents for a long time before I became a parent about these very same strategies, but when my motherly instinct kicked in and I didn't want my daughter to bump her head on the coffee table, this made a whole lot of sense to me. But um, we do need to remember that we do need to allow children to take some risks. Children, just like adults, uh, learn from making mistakes and everybody learns from picking themselves up after failure. Another related point is if you always solve problems or jump in um, when your child is having a, uh, having a problem, he or she may get the message that you don't, you don't think that he's capable of doing things on his or her own. And even taking that a step further, he might end up believing that he's not capable. So if my dad doesn't think I can handle um, going to day camp, well then I surely can't. Um, and they pick that up from their parents and, and begin to get those messages about self-efficacy and um, what they're capable of. Also, if children aren't permitted to take risks when they're younger, then how will they know how to keep themselves safe when they're older? So my daughter in the coffee table is now my daughter on the slide. Um, but your child who's a little bit older might be needing to make some decisions when they're not in your company and they're out with the teens and they need to decide whether to get into the car or whether they need to experiment with whatever's going on out there in their peer group. And if they haven't had some experiences younger, um, learning how to say no and navigate, navigating um, some kinds of difficult decisions, you don't want that first decision that they have to be in a potentially dangerous situation. There's a, a book um, that's kind of newly out written by a social worker at Dalhousie here in Halifax um, called Too Safe for Their Own Good, How Risk and Responsibility Help Teens Thrive. And it's not written specifically for youth with chronic illness. It's more written for teenagers in general. Um, but uh, Michael Ungar does a, a, a very nice job of talking about this idea of why it's important to encourage um, kids and youth to experience risk. And he says, too much risk and we endanger a child. Too little risk and we fail to provide a child with healthy opportunities for growth and development. He also says, if we don't offer children experiences that make them feel more adult-like, like competent, caring contributors to their communities, then they will find their own ways. And for him, and his, the theme of his book, this is a lot of um, why he thinks that some kids who seem to have it all, who've never wanted for anything, uh, grow up in so-called perfect families, end up really getting into risky behavior um, when they become a little bit older, or they might even end up on the street. Why is that? Um, and he feels that it's because they've never had this opportunity to try things out on their own at a younger age because they've been um, protected early on. So um, nobody in the audience I know is going to put their children in harm's way um, but and, and I'm certainly not suggesting that you do that um, but there are ways to help children to take safe risks and they might not even feel a whole lot like risks some of them um, but risks and responsibility taking so for younger children um, making small choices um, having chores or spending time away from you spending time with an aunt or a neighbor or a babysitter for a short period of time um, for older children letting them get that haircut or wear those clothes that you really don't like or sleeping over at a friend's or going to a relative's house um, for the weekend and you can be right there with your cell phone on and ready to respond to an emergency but the very fact that they're able to get out and uh, and do those things without you gives them a sense of responsibility that they can handle difficult situations on their own. For older teens, um, that might be extending a curfew, letting them get a part-time job, um, joining a uh, sports team, or getting a new hobby. Anything that makes them feel like they're being challenged and doing something outside of, um, a little bit outside of the norm for what their group might be. 
your medical team is always a good reference point. So if you're not sure, is it okay for my child to go to a sleepaway camp where they don't have uh, medical staff on site? Just call your medical team. Um, is it okay for my child to go to a sleepover where um, you know there might only be one adult in a group of in a group of ten children? Again, just call your medical team, and they are usually able to take themselves away from the emotion of it all and give you a, a balanced um, answer about what's a safe, calculated risk to be able to take. Um, again trusting your inner instinct, you're, you're not going to put your child into a situation that really is going to be potentially harmful to them. And also do recognize that some of the experiences that you've been through, particularly some of the traumatic experiences, might send off a stronger danger signal than might be realistic under the situation. So, you know, talk to your partner, talk to your other family members and, and check it out with them. It, you know, do you, do you think he can handle a day camp at this point? Um, do you think he can manage his medication at school um, without me being there? And, um, and, and start small. Um, Start young as well, and also notice your child's accomplishments. Notice them for your child, as in praising them and saying good job, but also notice them for yourself, because every time you see your child doing something um, that you know that brings on that sense of responsibility, you're you're going to feel less worried when they head out without you and without that extra protection that you're giving them. So, so when they do things on their own, really take notice for yourself. And also allow and encourage time with peers. There's um, lots of opportunities for risk with peers. They might um, lose a friend. They might um, get teased. And, and all kids um, learn from going through those experiences. It's important that if you have decided that a certain step is a safe risk, try not to let your child see you worry. Um, because children look to their adult caregivers for cues about what's safe and not. So if you're sending them on the bus to daycare and the tears are, or to, to day camp and the tears are streaming down, then, then they're going to get the cue that, uh oh, maybe this wasn't a good idea after all because clearly mom or dad isn't thinking this is a safe, um, safe thing to do and then they're not going to feel it's safe. You can still have your cell phone, just hide it away. Um, also remembering that your child is a child first and not a child with an illness. And I know most of you know this, um, but, but um, sometimes it feels like the biggest priority is keeping them safe when other priorities, such as being with friends, having accomplishments at school, having accomplishments outside of school are also very important to them as well. Also look to your child for evidence of how he or she are, is doing um, because kids are resilient. So an, another child that I'm thinking of is, is one that had a surgery that created a um, big scar in his torso and his um, dad had asked for the referral to know, to, to see somebody, to see if, if somebody could make sure he was doing okay, make sure he wasn't embarrassed about the scar, make sure um, he, he wasn't traumatized by having the scar. And, you know, an, a reasonable concern from a parent, you want to make sure that your child's okay that way, but it became pretty clear when talking to the boy that he, you know, went to the beach and took off his shirt and told everybody what his scar was all about. And I think if, if you sometimes take a little bit of time to actually look at your child's behavior and say, yeah, they actually, even though there's potential here and something to keep an eye on, they actually do seem to be doing fine with this, even, all, even after all that they've been through. Um, in some ways, kids are a lot more resilient than, than how adults would be going through the same experiences, and we have to really respect them for that. And also be careful not to give them any danger messages, like, you're not going to go to the beach, are you? Um, and, let, you know, and, and give them the message that maybe there ought to be something wrong with showing the scar to somebody. So how do we um, help children not just to take risks, but to move on and, and take more independence on their, on their journey? Um, there's a term called scaffolding in teaching and in psychology, um, which basically means supporting and guiding your child by providing activities that are just beyond the level of what he or she can do alone. And most parents do this instinctively. And a good example is what most parents do when their child is learning to walk, is you wait until they seem just 
bit ready to do it and then you give them some balance and as they get better at the balance you sort of maybe go to one hand or maybe let them alone for two steps or so and you want to keep that same principle going even when you're talking about more complex things as as people get older as youth get older so scaffolding in healthcare, um, some themes from before, starting young. So in a young child, it might be just wiping the alcohol swab on their arm before their injection, or it might be um, lining up the materials before they have to take their medication or something like that. Or, or um, as they get older, reading a package to see if the medication or the, the food that they're eating is, is okay. Starting small, so um, a good example of this would be medication. So if your child's on seven medications a day, you just say, okay, you're just going to be in charge of taking um, your morning pills or just in charge of taking your afternoon pills or just your pills on Saturdays and look for times that you think might be a little bit easier for them um, to have success with. You want to watch how they're doing with that before you add any new tasks to them. So a common um, referral that we get in, in health psychology is, uh, and, and there, you, know, you can see why this happens, but teenagers who are totally happy with having their parents involved with all of their care, parents who are totally happy being involved with all of their care, and it's all working fine until they both sort of mutually agree that they've reached an age where they should be doing things on their own. And everybody's in agreement with that, but then the parents just turn the care over 100% because the teen said that they were ready. But if the teen's not ready and they don't do well with 100% um, solo care, then everybody panics and, and um, people get upset and, and it becomes a, a challenge to get people back on track. But if you just start with, let's just start with Saturday morning pills and you be in charge of Saturday morning pills for three weeks and then you can be in charge of Saturday afternoon pills and Saturday morning pills for three weeks. And, and you'll know um, a lot sooner whether your child's having a hard time with that and give them a chance to, to um, adapt to doing things on their own. Um, and relatedly progress gradually to have the best chance for success. It's also important to make sure that there are no gaps in knowledge. Um, so a lot of times kids are diagnosed when they're very young or they're diagnosed when they're born and then we're not asking them to be involved in their care until they're much older but most of the education that happens about an illness happens uh, when diagnosis happens. And so people assume, well, this child has had this illness for 13 years. Obviously, they know about the illness. Obviously, they know why they take the medication. But there, there often isn't another opportunity for formal education from the medical team between diagnosis at age two and when they need to be more involved at age 13. So make sure that, don't make any assumptions about what they know about their illness or why they're taking certain medications or what the risks are going to be. Also recognize that it might be harder for your child to take on responsibility during periods of stress. Um, when I was in Ontario, I worked in a diabetes clinic and there was a clinical nurse specialist there who had diabetes herself. And I remember um, her telling me that on Fridays, after a long week, she would come home and say to her husband, honey, can you do my needles? And I, I try to remember that because she was a nurse, she had all of the knowledge, she was an adult, she was motivated for her care, there weren't any of the teen kind of issues that come up with teens, um, and yet there were days where she did not want to do her own diabetes care, she needed somebody else to help her. So if your um, child or teenager needs some help sometimes, don't see that as a setback or that they're being lazy or that they're not interested in their own care. They just might need some extra support. So um, the beginning of the school year, um, right when their exams are happening, that kind of thing. Or if they're, if they're not well. Also, obviously, um, give lots and lots of positive recognition for things that they are doing, even if it's just wiping their arm with the alcohol swab. Let them know that you're really appreciating the efforts that they're putting in. 
I'm going to spend a little bit of time on transitioning to adult care, and this will be most relevant to those of you who have um, teenagers, sort of 12, 13 and up, but um, something for those of you who are parents of younger kids to, to even be starting thinking about now. Um, there's a lot of differences between um, between the hospital system for for pediatric centers and adult centers. Um, some of the main ones, um, the adult centers look after a, a lot larger number of patients per physician. Um, the adult centers are more focused on individuals, whereas you know most um, pediatric centers are focused on families. They involve parents, they involve siblings, and other caregivers, um, and they also focus on pediatric conditions. So there might be, um, there are some children who are living with um, illnesses that uh, in previous years didn't have as long of a lifespan. So you, there might be adults, adult hospitals who aren't accustomed to dealing with children with those conditions because now um, with better care they're growing up longer, but they might not be as expert as um, the the physicians at the pediatric centers. Um, an example would be the cardiologists who deal with heart disease and um, you know all the problems that go along with being an older adult, but have less experience dealing with um, congenital heart conditions. So, so um, there are some challenges as you move from a pediatric center to an adult center. They're not insurmountable. Um, and people in the healthcare system are starting to really recognize this as something that we need to improve upon. So last spring there was a conference here in Halifax that was attended by physicians and social workers and psychologists um, and just talking about how we can do this better because people are realizing it's not as not a good idea to just when people turn 16 or 17 to just give them an appointment across the street and expect that they're going to uh, manage that transition okay. Um, some of the research that's been done recently recently has shown that uh, transition to adult health care is actually a time of increased health care dropout. So people never do get to that next appointment and they might not turn up at the hospital until they're in crisis um, and also increased relapses because they don't have those connections. Um, and again, at the IWK, they're really uh, working hard to think more about how to make this process easier for families. Um, Transition is a process. Um, at sick kids, they're really the leaders in this right now, and they say start at time of diagnosis. And I, I don't think by this they mean um, talking to your two-year-old about what it's going to be like across the street, but just start imagining um, what kinds of skills they might eventually need one day when the doctor is going to say to the parent, oh no, we don't need you in the room, we're just working with the individual. So you want to um, identify skills that are needed in the adult health care system and provide opportunities for supervised practice. So very young, you can start giving your child just a few minutes one-on-one -on -one with the nurse or with the physician. Um, you can ask them ahead of appointments to write down their questions. What do you want to get out of this visit? Um, what do, you, do you have any questions you want to ask the dietitian today? And start asking them um, very early on to start describing their illnesses and, and their medications. Um, like I said, the leaders right now in Canada on the topic of transition are in, at Sick Kids, and there's an excellent program that they have there called Good to Go, and I've um, put the website on there, uh, www.sickkids.ca forward slash good to go, and they have a lot of excellent materials about transition. They've got a readiness checklist that's um, uh, that there's one for teens and one for parents and it has questions about 20 questions that you can fill out. I can describe my chronic health condition to others. I know what my health may bring in the future. I speak up for myself and tell others what I need and questions like that. And you can um, identify areas that your, your teenager might need to work on. The other really nice feature they have on their website is something called My Health Passport. Um, so you can go in and answer questions like what is your medical condition, when was it diagnosed, what immunizations have you had, and it ends up printing out a little card um, for you with all of that information. So a teenager can carry that with them um, and if they're off at university and they have a problem they can just present themselves to the hospital or to their new doctor with all of that information readily available. 
what's really nice is they also they have little modules for different kinds of illnesses so if you have Crohn's disease or if you have um, arthritis then it'll ask it'll prompt you for specific um, questions about those illnesses so those are included on your health passport as well so now we're going to switch gears a little bit and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on, um, on the, these five topics, school attendance, uh, siblings, peers, depression, and parental stress. So first, um, school attendance. We know that youth with chronic illnesses have more legitimate absences from school. Um, they, need, they have doctor's appointments, they have hospitalizations, they're sick some days. Uh, but because of this, we also know that there are increased risk for school refusal. So what is school refusal? In a child with, uh, without a chronic illness, um, I don't know if you can see this, so I'll read it out. It's a, this is a cartoon about typical school refusal for, for kids without chronic illness. The little girl says, uh, my head hurts, my stomach aches, my throat is sore, my eyes are watery. And the mother who's seen this before says, of course, the amazing thing is how these very same symptoms seem to appear every Sunday night before bed. And she says, what's so amazing? School makes me sick. And the mom says, don't forget to set your alarm, drama queen. It's actually not typically this simple in even a child without a chronic illness. It can be a, a very significant problem um, when, kid, when parents aren't able to send their kids to school. But of course, you know that this um, same problem takes on a whole new host of difficulties because maybe the symptoms that your child is experiencing do need medical attention or do mean that they need to stay home from school and they also do have legitimate absences so some of the things um, that we notice makes kids at more um, risk for um, for school refusal are missing academic um, academic material so they might get frustrated about being behind they might get worried about being behind um, look out especially for things like math where what you did last week you need to know it in order to know it next week in order to be able to understand next week so a possible solution is to talk to the teacher, make sure that the child's not going to get tested on, on material that they haven't seen before, um, see if they can get some help getting caught up from another student, um, from a tutor, or and a lot of times people just take materials home so that they can stay caught up along the way. When your um, child gets older, you can help them to advocate for themselves so they can be the ones to talk to the teacher and say, look, I'm going to be out of school for two weeks and, and I need to know what I'm going to miss and how I'm going to plan for it. A lot of um, young people also worry about missing what's going on socially. So I hear my best friend is hanging out with the new girl. So when I go back, where is that going to leave me? Who's going to be my partner? Um, what if I don't like the new girl? What if she doesn't like me? Or for kids who are on um, sports teams, what if they didn't save my place in the team? What if, you know, how's that going to work out? So if you know that your child's going to be away from school, school for a long time, helping them to stay connected as much as possible, whether that be through a phone call, through visits, um, through all the internet ways that kids communicate now. Um, and it often doesn't take a lot for, for the kids to feel like they're still connected. Um, many youth also worry about what to tell their peers. Everyone's going to ask, where were you? And some people are comfortable um, with that question and some people aren't. Uh, so it's worth spending some time um, discussing with your child what they're going to say and even role playing what they're going to say. And some young people are actually more comfortable um, having somebody help with that. So the teacher before they come back might say so and so was, it, was away because they had a surgery and this is what happened. Um, so that they know that the kids aren't going to ask a lot of questions when they come back. Um, it's important to know that whatever information is shared, your child should have a say in, in that because it is their private information. But we also know um, that the, their peers are likely to respond more bet, uh, better if they have a little bit of information. And it doesn't need to be a lot of information. It can just mean be, uh, they had a surgery or they were sick, so they were in the hospital and they're fine now, um, depending on the age of, of the peers. Um, another big one is changes in abilities or appearance and again um, with consent give age-appropriate information so um, he took a medicine that made his 
hair fall out or um, she, that tube is to help the food get directly into her stomach or um, she probably won't be able to keep up with you in the playground as much as she used to for the next couple of weeks and most kids once they get a little bit of information that's that's fine enough for them um, similarly, some children, uh, before they leave school, they might have had something embarrassing happen to them. Maybe they collapse in the classroom or have a seizure. Um, and again, probably the, the most helpful thing is to give information to the students. The young person can do that or other people can do that. But you also want to help them maybe to examine some of the evidence there. Um, you know, everyone was laughing at me. Well, do you think they were? Um, you know, uh, who, who was around? It was John John and, and Mark and Tom, those are your best friends. Like, do you really think that they would, they would be laughing at you? No, but um, maybe they were staring. Well, what, and why do you think they might have been staring? Well, they, maybe they were worried. Okay, so, so maybe it's not such an embarrassing event after all, but they need to think about um, maybe what was actually happening on the other side of that embarrassing situation. Um, you can also help them by asking them to consider how they would respond if another young person had the same, same event happening to them. So if you saw um, another child fall or, or um, have something else happen to them, how do you think you would respond? Would you, would you find that was funny or would you be concerned? And, and most kids will realize that, oh yeah, okay, I guess my, my friends were probably gathering around because they were concerned, not because they were, they were there to tease me. Another thing that happens um, when young people stay at home because of illness is they, they often fall into habits. So they might get into watching a favorite um, TV program uh, that happens midday, or they might get into sleeping in until 10 o'clock, or they might get very comfortable spending time with you or um, with a grandparent or a neighbor who stays home. Um, and those habits can be very hard to break. Or maybe they're on online gaming all day long, and that's a habit that's very hard to break. So if your child's starting to feel better, um, what you want to do and you're looking at going back to school, you want to start getting them back into a school-like routine. So getting up at the same time that they would have to get up um, on a school day, um, limiting the amount of TV, um, limiting the amount of computer time, that kind of thing. Other, other ways to avoid problems um, with attendance. Um, again, your medical team is an excellent resource uh, for rules of when to send your child to school. So, so I'm, I'm sure it's difficult when your child who has a chronic illness says, I don't feel well and I can't go to school. Um, but most medical teams can give clear guidelines like a fever over this or a blood sugar over that or under that. Um, and that should give you some guidelines around how to handle those situations. For lots of young people, um, they might not have to stay home from school. They might be able to go to school um, and rest until they're feeling better and then return to class. So they're not missing as much class time. Um, they, they're missing some class time, but they're not missing a full day. Also be on the lookout for signs that they might be um, missing school for reasons other than illness. So if they're always doing that Sunday night thing or um, they always seem to want to stay home more on days that you're there or days that you're not there or if they have a big test then you know that it's probably not to do with their illness and it might be due to other factors. Um, let them know that you're proud of them for going to school, especially probably on those days where they're feeling kind of crummy. If your child has a, a chronic illness, that might mean that they might have good days and bad days all through their life. Um, then they're going to need to know how to figure this out when they've got a job and get to work even if they're not feeling 100%. And so um, paying attention to those days where they're putting their best effort forward as well. Also make sure that your child is comfortable knowing when their symptoms mean they need help or how to handle emergencies. Um, so I, you can imagine if a child's not comfortable with what's going to happen in the case of emergency, then they're, they'd probably rather stay home where they feel it's safe. So make sure that they know that the school knows how to handle different situations. If your child is really struggling because of their illness and um, you're finding that they're missing a lot of days and not able to keep up with their workload, um, you might also might consider modifications to their course load. So, um, you know, in most cases, um, 
going to three classes 100% of the time is better than going to four classes 75% of the time. They'll feel better about their accomplishments that way. And also keep in mind um, that distraction is huge in terms of managing different kinds of symptoms such as pain and nausea. So um, getting them out there, getting them with their friends can actually make them feel a whole lot better. Okay, so the next um, topic, siblings. Um, we know that all families have to balance the needs of different individuals, and I'm going to say it at least one more time, that that can become a whole lot of a bigger challenge in parents who have children with a chronic illness. Um, one model of what a family is like is uh, a mobile. So you can see this mobile of the fish, and you can imagine that if one of these fish uh, was pulled on very suddenly and strongly, the other fish in the group would would move and um, need to compensate for that and um, that's how you can think about a significant event happening in in your family um, so it's obviously going to take an impact on siblings so some tips um, provide age-appropriate information as much as you can even to young kids because um, they often uh, come up with their own ideas about what hospitals mean and what sick means and what surgeries mean um, so if you can give them some information that can um, calm their fears have open communication about their feelings about that it's a good idea to talk about um, the illness rather than the name of their sibling. So, oh, the Ill you know, Jenny's illness is really causing a lot of problems these days as, so that they can start, if they have to be angry at something or frustrated about something, they're not frustrated about the person, they're frustrated about what really is causing the problem, which is the illness and the things that the illness is doing. Um, it can be normal to, for siblings to have small regressions in their behavior during periods of stress. So younger children, you might see them going back to baby talk or if they had been toilet trained, maybe having some accidents. Um, and don't be too alarmed by this. The more life gets back to normal, um, the more these things should come back to where they used to be. But if their regressions do involve acting out behavior just with your child with the illness, the rules are still the rules and they still need to have those limits in place even if you know where that stress is coming from. Um, I don't want to add extra guilt to, to parents who are dealing with difficult situations, but um, you do want to make sure that you provide attention to the sibling needs as well, even in the time of crisis. And if you can't do it, um, it doesn't always need to come from you. So arranging for a relative or a neighbor to do a special activity with a sibling or make sure that the sibling still gets to their swimming lessons um, is still looking after their needs. And remembering that you don't need to do as much as you always do, um, little messages to let them know that you're still um, in their thoughts can, can mean a lot to them. So a note in their lunch, or I guess now it would be texting, um, or a planned one-on-one -on -one activity that um, you, know, you always do no matter what's going on, or a bedtime routine. So now a little bit about peer issues. Um, there's some good things about peer relationships in youth with chronic illness. Um, and as a general rule, when this topic has been researched, uh, youth with chronic illness might have fewer friends, but the friendships that they do have have a deeper quality to them. Um, so when friends go through things together, it brings them closer. So they, they may not be the one that's friends with everybody in the school, but they might have friends for life that they keep um, and I've certainly, I've certainly seen this in the work that I've done with um, young people, that they make very, very good friendships. They also have, often have um, increased empathy for others, and that's not just for um, other people who are having problems with illness, but it might be other people who have problem, problems with their economic situation or their family situation. Um, youth with chronic illness seem to, um, because of what they've been through, really be able to understand and, and be tolerant of some of the challenges that other people are having. And I said this a little bit before, but um, one important thing for peer issues is remembering um, that in general, if peers are given some information, that tends to help with the situation, knowing that you do need to talk to your, your um, child or, or teenager um, about how much information they want to disclose. 
Um, you probably all already know this, but in case you don't, um, there's lots of opportunities out there to interact with peers with similar challenges um, through camps, um, online opportunities, as long as they're safe and supervised. Um, you can ask uh, the nurse on your medical team, do you know anybody around the same age with a similar difficulty? Um, medical teams aren't going to offer that to you, um, but if you ask for it, then they're uh, more than willing to, to hook you up with a, somebody that your, your child can email or, or get together with. And if your child has a very rare condition, don't be afraid to ask for something that's kind of similar. Um, and there's also lots of associations, obviously, that help and put on um, talks and workshops and things like that. Um, one, one thing that's kind of interesting recently is there's some, also some evidence that adolescent peers can help with adherence to treatment. So those of you who are um, parents of teenagers know that uh, peers, uh, friends of teenagers often have a much greater influence on teenagers than their parents do. And um, that can have a negative association, but it can also be good for adherence. So if, the, if your teenager's friends know why it's important that they don't eat gluten or that they make sure they test their blood sugars before they get into a car, um, then, then they're often the ones that tell them what to do and they're going to listen to their, their friends a lot more than they're going to listen to you. I just want to spend a couple of minutes on um, depression. Um, depression can obviously be a very normal reaction to difficult life events. So um, if your child is feeling down um, following you know, a setback, a relapse, a surgery, uh, a major event that they had to miss because of their illness, um, that's absolutely understandable. But you want to see them um, get back to their old self um, after, after a period of time when things start getting going better for them. Um, because we know that youth with chronic illness are also at increased um, risk of clinical levels of depression that should receive specialized treatment. So um, some symptoms of depression that you want to look for, sadness or hopelessness, um, something that often gets missed, particularly in teenagers, irritability, anger or hostility. So you might think your, your teenage boy um, doesn't seem sad, but he off, he's awfully irritable. Um, you might consider depression. Um, tearfulness or fre frequent crying. A big one is withdrawal from friends and family and loss of interest in activities and changes in eating and sleeping habits. Um, you'll notice that a lot of these have a lot to do with illness, which makes this a lot harder uh, for parents and even for physicians and psychologists to sort of tease apart what's happening. So if they're taking a medication that makes them more irritable, if, they're, um, if their illness has made them lose weight or gain weight or be unable to sleep or have more fatigue. Um, so it can be hard to tease out, but you still want to um, consider that your child could be depressed. Also looking for feelings of worthlessness and guilt, lack of enthusiasm and motivation, fatigue or lack of energy, again a, a big difficult one to know what to do with with illness, uh, difficulty concentrating or thoughts of death or suicide. If you're worried about any of these kinds of things, um, you should talk to either your, your specialist that's handling the chronic illness or even to your family doctor and they can usually point you in the right direction. So the last um, topic I'm going to talk about today is parental stress, and um, I, I, I think you know I'm, I, the focus of, of most of what I've talked about is on the kids, and this matters for the kids as well. It matters for you most certainly, but it also affects how your child is doing, um, because you as parents can also influence your children's coping. You do that through coaching, through modeling, and through creating a positive home environment. And we know that how the family is doing has a direct impact on how the child is coping or adjusting with their chronic illness. We also know that how you're feeling about things is going to influence a lot of your um, parenting decisions. So if you're feeling very, very worried, then you're going to hold your child back or be more overprotective. If you're feeling very stressed, that might help make, make you make different kinds of decisions. So um, 
if you don't want to look after yourself because you're thinking you need to put your child as the priority, you do need to consider that looking after yourself is looking after your child. And there's an analogy that you might have heard before, and that is the analogy of being on a plane when, um, when the stewardess or the steward says, if the oxygen uh, pressure changes in the cabin, you should, and you're traveling with a young child, you should put the mask on first and not put it on your child first. And most people kind of um, react to that because obviously you want to give your child oxygen before you want to give yourself oxygen because that's what a caring parent would do. But in fact, if you don't put the oxygen on yourself, you won't be in any kind of state to look after your child in a state of emergency. Uh, so you want to think about that same kind of analogy. If you're not looking after your own stress and your own coping, you're not going to be in an okay position to help your child through difficult situations. Related to that, we know that there's a um, strong relationship between uh, parental mental health and children's adjustment. And that goes both ways. So obviously, if your child is not doing well, then that's going to affect how you're doing. If you're not doing well, that's going to affect how your child is doing. We know that parents of children with chronic illness are two to three more times, two to three times more likely to receive mental health services and may experience relatively higher rates of stress, depression, and anxiety, and even um, post-traumatic stress disorder, which you've probably heard about um, examples, people coming back from war that have flashbacks and can't sleep and um, cope by drinking alcohol and get irritable all the time and jumpy. Well, parents who have been through trauma um, with their children in the hospital or otherwise um, also experience these same symptoms and and if that's happening um, you should be seeking out support for yourself as well so I'll just go through some some general ideas about coping with your own stress um, nurturing your primary relationships um, partners often uh, get forgotten about during periods of stress. Partners um, separate from another because one another because they're dealing with their own stresses. But it's important to try to remain connected um, with your partner as much as possible, um, with your friends, with your other family members. Um, using social supports. Focusing on the positives um, as much as possible, uh, trying not to focus only on the negatives. Um, rainy day letter is a specific strategy that I like and that is everybody has good days. Um, so when you have one of those good days, when you're thinking about um, all the good things that are going on in your life, write yourself a letter, dear Elizabeth, today is good. Um, I like what's going on here and there. And then when you're having a bad day, you open up that letter and you're hearing your, from your own words um, why some things might be going a little bit better than, than you're feeling on a rotten day. Um, examining the evidence. So again, um, sometimes it can be overwhelming to focus on the negatives, but if you focus on, gee, you know, a lot of things might be going um, in, a, in a wrong way with my family right now, but actually here are the things that are going right. And, and uh, actually write those things down, what's, what's on the good side and what's not on the not the good side, and see if you can um, find some ways to feel better about some things. Um, some people enjoy um, just expressing themselves, so through writing, through talking, through music, um, exercise just helps with your physiological stress and your mental stress. Um, also religion or prayer and therapy. And again, usually um, if you're not sure where to go for therapy, the, a good place to start is your family physician who can usually point you in the right direction.